I think we're all at a space where you and I have to, if not daily, maybe weekly, have to decide how we respond to what we see happening around us. Um, and I realize that understanding what it means to have influence is probably now as necessary as it was to understand as it's ever been, but the influence that you and I are exposed to is probably the, the strongest energy we have to deal with than ever before. And not only do we sense that we are influenced by many things, the, the uh, ability to discern about what we hear. You hear a lot of things, and um, you have to discern. I, I see more and more how news channels put at the bottom why you can trust us. I'm thinking, why is it necessary to say that? Because we don't. Yeah. You have to filter very carefully what's being said and why is it said and what is the aim of it. And, and in the middle of that, what does the Bible say? And do you hear God's voice? And are you making the difference that you want to have? And, and what does it even mean? So we prayerfully considered this time and said, God, don't you want to help us understand what it means to be an influencer? It's a term that I had to learn in the last few weeks. It's a thing online. And I said an influencer is somebody who shares something on their life, whatever they do. I mean, changing the world to brushing your teeth, you can influence people like the motion you use. Is it twice left and once right? Or I don't, Who cares? But that's an influencer. You know? So it's important that we as a church talk about what does it mean for us to be influenced in the right way and to be the influencers that God called us. And if we don't talk about it now, we'll probably be influenced by how the world just wants to get out of gear and free flow your car right to the end. You know, just right off November, it is just a free flow to getting a new start at least. And I'm thinking if God wanted a year to be 10 or 11 months, it probably would have been. But now we have to do the whole 12. So if God has a plan for every month of the year, I believe for this time as well. So let's discover that together. Now, as we're talking about influence, there's a powerful effect that we have on one another. And you know that. I'm saying what you know. But there's a very powerful effect that we sense from other people. Now, you can pick it up if you go into a room what the emotions are. Sometimes you say the tension is so thick you can cut through it. Now, you, you know. You know when you're at a party and there's this one person that just wouldn't keep quiet. You know, they, it's like this dear old bunny. They're just going. And you're thinking, you know, can't you see we all had a rough week? What the hell is wrong with you? You know, it's like they're immune to that influence. But they have an influence back and you can pick it up. If you wake up in the morning in your home, you know what everybody's feeling. You, you don't have to ask, how are you doing? You just check the faces. You go, okay. It's that kind of morning. And if you're not careful, you go, going, oh, so is mine. So if we are not careful, we are very susceptible for what happens. I have to be honest with you. I see it in, in the type of preachers we have. Yeah, so the very somber kind that I grew up with, I mean, it's, we say it as it is, and we say it for an hour, and you just have to stick with it, and you keep very quiet. And then you get the charismatic ones, and they go, Hallelujah! And then? Hello! No, amen. No, you guys, no. <laughs> So you so they walk up and down and say, are you with me? And then we go, you see, you, I'm influencing you just that easily. <laughs> and then somewhere in the middle, you know, it's me. And then, so we, we have an influence and we respond to whatever happens around us. It's a very real energy. And maybe now and then I'll just go hallelujah and then we'll see what happens there. And if I'm honest with you, there's this comment that a preacher made years ago. He said, if people in the audience fall asleep when I'm preaching, don't wake them up, wake me up. <laughs> yeah. But I have to be honest, but I don't know what to do in that moment. I would sometimes just go, and God said something, and everybody, amen, in that moment. <laughs> so it's easy to have influence in that way. But I want to I show you a video of a Coca-Cola ad that just showed how powerful positive influence can be. Just have a look at this video. Ha, 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 ha. 
Now, half of you were laughing, the other half was smiling, and then the other five of you, I don't know what the hell was wrong with you. <laughs> I'm surprised at how easy it is. You know, I thought, let me try it, but what came out wasn't, I was more frowning than laughing with me, so I thought, let's, you know, use the positive influence. But it is, to me, sometimes astonishing how little it takes to be a good influence. They didn't have the beautiful music in the background like we have, like this nice kind of video. They just laughed with this guy. And I just thought, okay, if that's what we can see as a powerful interaction between people, what does the Bible teach us? What does Jesus say about this? And I hope that today there will be something that awakens in your heart where you realize the immense power we have. And that what we do influences for the good or for the bad around us. Now we see that in the Bible, Proverbs are two scriptures that I want to read to you that talks about this impact that we're having, this influence on one another. Proverbs 27 verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. Okay, now I've got a, a knife at home out of iron and a little sharpener. Now when you take that knife and you pull it over it, it makes this awkward <laughs> sound. Like a short in electric current, kind of that sound. And I'm going, ew, every time you have to pull it, it's like you get all those funny chills down your back. But afterwards, that knife can cut. And I realize the Bible says there's something that you and I are doing to one another that sometimes hurts a little bit, but good friends will sharpen us if we are really influencing in a godly way. Proverbs 13 verse 20 says, Walk with the wise and become wise. Associate with fools and get in trouble. When you associate with the right people that are wise, they will influence you. That's why I hang out with you guys. Amen. Thank you. I gave her 20 rounds to do that. Thank you, sir. The Bible says that the influence you will receive is sometimes happening unintentional, so spend time with the right people. That's why I don't miss a Sunday. If I'm here, I'm here, because I want you guys to rub off on me and vice versa. There was a teacher in London when me and myself were staying there at my school where I was teaching for a couple of years, and um, I was there for about a year or two. Then this guy came, I think he was from New Zealand, Mr. Tag, he was called. Very fun guy. Man, he was going, good day, mate, to all the, you know, I don't know, it sounds more Australian than New Zealand, what do I know, I've never been there. But he was this energy guy and connecting with all the kids, and he taught geography. Now, they liked him so much, he was such a strong influencer, they had a massive problem, because at the end of that year, the year group that had to choose a subject for the next year, all chose geography. So... Never again did they have so many people choosing geography in history. No, that's, that was funny to me at the moment because nobody chose history. So that's the problem they had. So they had to get in more teachers to teach geography. And the history department went, we're going to nobody here. So I asked the kids. Some of them were in my form. I said, listen, I didn't know you were so interested in rivers and mountains and the weather. He said, I can't care a word I can't say. I just like Mr. Tag." I said, you're choosing a subject that will influence your studies and your future. So I don't care. I want to be with him. (laughs) 
wherever he goes, I want to be. And I realized, thinking back of that, the strong influence he had. And people have on different people at different times in your life. And, and if we are not careful, it can lead us wherever they want us to go. And whatever we say to people will have the same effect. The amount of people that we heard singing and say, why don't you join us on stage? Oh, no, I can't sing. And if you trace it back, that great one teacher. <laughs> Teachers, don't do that. Oh, you, no, rather sit there and keep quiet. You can hand out the leaflets, but don't sing. For the rest of their lives, it takes you no amount of counseling can fix what that teacher did in that moment. But the opposite is true. A teacher that influences, or any coach, or any trainer, or parent that influences a child at the right time, you will have to work hard to break it down if it was done right. And we know that. And we all experience that. I think you all can think of those people in your life that influence you very strongly. I couldn't help but think of great influences over history. If you think of one of the many revivalists, John G. Lake, that came to this country, did a lot of revival teaching and evangelism, and the AFM denomination that we are part of was born out of that. One guy, one guy, passionate. And many people are the result of that. Thousands and thousands upon thousands over many, many years. If you think politically, what Nelson Mandela has done in believing that this country can be representative of everybody staying here and what price he had to pay to get that done, uh, Technological giants like Steve Jobs who, who dreamt about a specific way of using technology like many have and many people here are, are the result of what he has done. And then ultimately, the greatest influence of all Jesus. That even though he's not in person here but in spirit among us and eternal, so many, millions and millions of followers that in three years changed the world. And I know there are some countries that don't serve him, but I don't think there's any nation that's not been influenced by this one man. And here we are, the recipients of his power and his grace as the ultimate influencer. I think we, we need to choose carefully. The radar that we have, this dish of receptors, that we just... Maybe like I sometimes have to do, just think carefully out of all the media that I'm exposed to, all the people that call themselves influencers, all the celebrities that I perhaps know of, politicians. Sometimes I see that if you're a movie star, then suddenly your opinion is so important. You make movies, but you know everything about every topic. And I'm saying, let's be very careful who we allow to influence us. Now, we want to get our kids Influence proof. And I think sometimes we get to that place, especially as parents and for our three kids, I'm thinking, how do I safeguard them? How do I protect them? In, in a way, wrap them from not being influenced in the wrong way. And is the Bible perhaps telling us to be careful, watch out, sit back, close yourself in? Or is there a different approach? And if I look at what Jesus has said, then he's not promoting this careful sit in a room and lock yourself in kind of approach, but he's got a very proactive approach to not be careful about just what influences you, but do you understand how powerfully you can influence? So we take our cue from Jesus on everything. And here he says, guys, I want you to influence because you can and you should. So in Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, Jesus speaks and everybody sits in a much rougher environment than you are in on a field outside and he, and he teaches them what it means to be part of the kingdom of God and bless all those who are this and bless all those who are that. If you haven't read it recently, please do. But then he reads, and Miller mentioned last week these scriptures that we know very well, but I want to remind you of the salt and light conversation that Jesus introduced. Okay, and we're going to read it together. You are the salt of the earth but what good is salt if it has lost its flavor? Can you make it salty again? It will be thrown out and trampled underfoot as worthless. You are the light of the world, like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. And no one lights a lamp and then puts it under a bucket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. 
In the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. I think it is a good reminder for us to ask again, why would Jesus use these examples? He could have said, guys, be good people. But he realized we have to understand something of the beauty of what God created. And we talk about salt, then quick reminder of what salt does. It's got a few functions. It has the ability to preserve, to enhance taste, to clean, to restore, to improve health. If you think of all these attributes, Jesus obviously knew exactly what he was saying. Saying, guys, you can preserve life. You can help cleanse where darkness or sin polluted somebody's mind. You, you can come and restore. You can come and enhance the experience of God. Maybe the way that we engage one another, we can talk and then in that conversation, we discover something about God and then something of the taste of who God is came out. And he reminded them what he has created them to be. To be careful that it's not just this concept, oh, I am salt, I am salt. You know, I don't know what it means. You know, I kind of carry it around and, 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 and try and figure it out. I think... Dr. Dao, in the journey we've had, has helped us to understand that it's about faith and about love and about hope. Faith to reach those people who don't know Jesus. This week I had a conversation with um, two young people and I asked them the basic question, are you guys sure? Do you know for sure that if this life ends, that eternity is with God, they can say, oh, we can just hope. I said, what is the basis of your hope? Oh, I just have to be the best person I can be. So I couldn't help but ask, are you that good person? Don't think so. And I could tell them the gospel of Jesus and what he's done. And that sin has to be taken care of and Jesus has. And you could just see their eyes going, what? Faith is the way that we share the salt reality. When people are hopeless and broken and they don't know what to do, we bring hope. And those who are in desperate need of love, we give love because the pain that people carry, we can love away in a beautiful way. I had to go and quickly look, what prevents us from being that church? What prevents us from being sold? If we say, well, that's great, I want to do that, but it doesn't always happen with me. It looks like the scientists are saying it's very hard for you to cancel what salt is and can do. The attributes of salt, it, it is what it is. But there are ways that Jesus mentioned that it can lose its taste. And out of the, the reasons mentioned, there were two that stood out for me. And the first one was salt becomes ineffective when chemical impurities are added to it. Now that was fascinating. It doesn't change the salt. It puts something to it that suddenly makes the taste go weird. And I, and I was pondering, I said, God... Is there something that is added to me that changes the saltiness that I should have, maybe as a church, maybe as Christians? And, and I think it became obvious in that moment that sometimes we allow all these other things to influence us to such an extent that we add to what God is saying and not illuminate what He's already said. We try to be so clever in having other people explain things that are not grounded in the Word of God. And then we add philosophies and ideas about God just to make sense of our world and to justify the things which we sometimes do. And I think then sometimes people look at us and go, I don't see the alignment of what you do with what the Bible says and what you claim to align with. And I had to think for a moment, God, am I maybe adding thoughts to the way that I want to serve you that justifies the way I want it to be. Typical ones are, oh, Gerard, he's a great evangelist. I hope he goes, because I don't to share my faith, listen to him. And he is a great one, but God called us all to share faith. But now suddenly I'm adding these impurities and I'm making my saltiness go so weak that I don't expect anybody to taste anything about life in my life because of great people like him or Paul and Sharon or Liesl or Clinton, whoever. And I'm thinking, God, don't allow that for me, please, to happen. Help me to bring that out in people and show me through your spirit what it means. The second thing they mention is when salt is diluted in water. A little bit of salt in too much water, you don't taste it anymore. We've spent some time in conversation here where we said we should not fit in so well 
That we just want to fit into the world that we're in. We don't, we don't want to have a taste. We just want to be accepted because the opinion of people became bigger than the opinion of God. And I think then we lose the taste because nobody even notices. We want to fit in so well. Romans says don't. Don't fit in so well that nobody can see the difference. Renew your mind so that you can be what God called you to be. When Jesus speaks about light, it's a beautiful thing because... You and I, being light, is an energy. It's not competing with darkness. Isn't that strange? We're saying the darkness is so strong. I don't know if my light can do anything there. Scientifically, it's impossible. Darkness is the absence of light. It's not a force. Spiritually, we sometimes feel there's a force behind it, but it's an overcome one through Jesus. So when you and I walk and God says, hey, influence, you walk in as a light. No candle, ask permission to light up a room. Or stand at the door and wish it could go in and light it up, but the darkness is so dense. But the world wants to tell us, oh, you can't do anything about that place. Your influence will be very meek and not noticeable even. But when Jesus said, you are the light of the world, he said, guys, you're walking into a space where darkness will run when you just allow God to shine through you. Eugene Peterson says this very beautifully when he says, I'm putting you on a light stand. Now that I've put you on a hilltop, on a light stand, shine! Exclamation. Keep open house, be generous with your lives. By opening up to others, you'll prompt people to open up with God, this generous Father in heaven. So Jesus says, you are the light. You are placed somewhere. Don't cover it. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't underestimate the power of it. Wherever you are positioned, whoever is in your house, whoever is in your environment, you are positioned there. And that's your space. And that's where you'll shine. And you just trust God. God, I don't know. This person, that person, and, and this environment, and this situation feels too big for me. Again, I think God is just saying, guys, salt, light. Bring out the colors. Bring the godliness out. Restore what I intended it to be. You can do it. You've got my spirit. Just go for it. As a congregation, God positioned us here in this mall. And ever since, almost seven years ago, God placed us here. We said, okay, so what? Are we, this is just a nice space. And we quickly realized God called us to influence a business environment, partner with people here, and see to it that the well-being of the people can be achieved through Christ being ministered to the space. Different seasons, different ways. And, um, and ever since we're figuring it out, and many of you have been part of this initiative, and we know many of the shop owners and managers and employees, and some of them are sitting here with us. And it's wonderful. We're a community now. And we're very excited about the carols at Parkview happening on the 2nd of December. I want to tell you, this is how we include them all. We've got a choir from church people and shop employees that will be the choir on that day. And we're going to be in the parking area if it's not raining, minus one parking if it is raining, and we can have an incredible community serving Jesus together. Okay? So that's going to be wonderful. Now, not just only that. This morning, um, I've got a treat to have a partner in ministry in this mall, and that's the manager of Woolies, Andre Havenga with us. Andre, come and join me on stage, please. Let's welcome Andre. Now, some years ago, I had the privilege to, to meet Andre, and um, in our conversations, I quickly realized he's a man of God that has a very specific way of doing business, um, as God called him. Can we just have the mic, please, honey? And um, I asked Andre to join us because this is a guy that is not seeing this as a place of making an income. Um, you can sit, Andre, but it's a place where God called him. So we had a good chat in the week, and we had several coffees before in Willis, obviously. And um, I just had to, you know, it would be weird sitting at Checkers and drinking coffee at uh, Willis. And, um, and through many conversations, I heard that God is using him, and we are working together. He's taking the ground level, we're taking level one. Um, and between us, we've, we're really trusting God to do great things. But Andre, it's good to have you. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. And um, Andre, I want you to, to tell us, because I don't think everybody here knows what it means to manage a Woolies and here at Parkview. Um, it looks fantastic. I mean, you've got the logo, you're walking around, and you're the big boss there. But um, we're clueless. Tell us just, you know, what's it like to manage Woolies here? 
First of all, um, I don't think anyone sits in matric or, or sits at school and says, I want to be a store manager of a retail store. <laughs> like some people will say, I'm re I really want to be a doctor or a lawyer. So it's, it's, it's really not glamorous. Mm. Um, but in, in my life, I wanted to be a child psychologist because I feel my calling is to help people in wh whichever way. But uh, God intended for me and my boss to end up as a store manager. So, so what, we, what we do is you, you are a father, a mother, a lawyer, a, a retailer, counselor. A, a, a counselor, a, <laughs> a bit of everything, which is, is it's so amazing. It, not one day is the same. Hmm. Um, I've been in the retail environment for 25 years now, and I'm still waiting for the perfect day. <laughs> um, you just never know. You, you plan your day, but you never know what comes up. So, which, which, but if you know who made the day, you, mm. you don't know what's going to happen in the day, but you know who made the day. Mm. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's mm. amazing. Mm. Um, so, yeah, um, if it rains, there's an influence in the business. If, if there is someone in your, on, in your staff that has got personal issues, you need to, you need to be able to engage and to, to guide and you, you get confronted with a lot of stuff that you didn't, you, you just didn't learn. Um, hmm. But through the Holy Ghost and through the, through asking for wisdom and walking in the kingdom, it's, it's just amazing. Um, how you can actually deal with all of these things. But um, I want to ask you, in, uh, that, that the tension that you have with the expectation from this big brother, Mr. or Mrs. Woolworths, and you have to make it work. I mean, how, how much pressure do you experience? Is it just glorious, everything goes well? I mean, in this economic time, what was it like the last two, three years with, through COVID and all that to run the shop? Challenging quite challenging, especially through the COVID. Mm. Um, it's, it's once again something that, that you are confronted with. No one is prepared for, for something like that. Mm. And um, at, at one stage, we had to actually split the store in two, uh, whereby we are not allowed to engage with, with certain of our staff and management and so on. And through this radical change, we had to still deliver to the targets and the budgets and like any, like any business, mm. and you still need to deliver. Mm. Uh, communication uh, channels has changed. It was all new to us, especially me that comes from the old school, not with the virtual world. Um, but that's change, mm. and you need to embrace change, and you need to go through this. Mm. Um, the macro environment, the, if another store opens down the road, um, obviously, you lose a lot of customers, and what we we, we lost 12% uh, of our customers to another store, a Woolworths store, thank goodness, that opened that <laughs> opened down the road. But the expectation is still, if this is your target, you need to deliver. Mm, sure. Um, so there they, there's pressures. There there's a lot of pressures. I can imagine. Now, when I listened to you say this to me the first time a few months ago, I thought maybe two, three days, I'll make it, and then I'm off to the hills. Not the estate, the actual hills, you know. Um, but you are still here, and you are still doing it. And I, I have to tell, tell you, what, whatever keeps you in this position, and not trying to do something that's easier, where you don't have to play all those roles, I, I would have probably considered if that was me. Um, but you are here, and there's something else that keeps you doing what you're doing. What is that, Andre? Parkview is one of our biggest food stores that we've got and, and um, what we call a flagship store and the expectations is perfect. You, you need to be perfect at all the, in all, all ways, all the time. But nobody's perfect. Mm. When, when I heard that I, that I was moved here, immediately I asked God, God, you want me to do something in that space. You want me there. Thank you for that but also guide me, give me the wisdom, give me the, the knowledge that I would need to do 
that I need to have to do what I need to do. I don't know what it is. I don't know how long you'll be here. But I know that God placed me here for something. I don't know what it is. And as long as, as, long as you, you, you walk in the kingdom and you understand, it's, it wasn't the company that, that placed you here. Um, and as long as that, it, it's just, it's amazing. Huh. You, you, can't, you can't not be here and run away. Yeah. You, you, you spoke um, in our conversation um, that calling can be so overriding whatever you're facing that that drives you every day. And you said earlier, just you wake up knowing that God made that day. But how do you keep calling and purpose alive and real to you when you know you're called to influence, but it just sometimes feels impossible around you? How do you do that? You need to, you, you, can't, you can't pour from an empty cup. Mm. You, you, you give and give, and you, you know that you, the light must shine through you, but like a candle, it also starts burning, and, and, and you get tired. The important thing is, you need to fill up your cup every single day. Mm. Every day, worship, every day, stay in the presence of God, learn more, learn more, mm. and the more you learn, the stronger you become mm. through the Holy Ghost, and and you are ready, you are, you're fired up for the day. Yeah. Day after day after day. Mm. Um, it, a human being cannot do that. Yeah, true. Yeah, and I think that's part of the testimony. Those who choose to shine and keep shining in that space, um, everybody runs where it's more comfortable. Everybody runs where there's a great opportunity and sometimes it is God moving you. But um, what I've been so blessed by is how you know you've been called here and God purposed you to bring something to this space as we are as a church. Um, and that's incredible, Andre, and I want to salute you for that. It encourages me to know that you are here, you know. So you look up to God, and then I look down to Woolies, and there's Andre. <laughs> and from top to bottom, I'm covered, so that's great. <laughs> but I want, to, I want to ask you, Andre, um, many times we shine, and we don't see the effect. And you, you know, there are those seasons where you think you're pouring out and out and out and out, and you just wonder, you know, if there's something that is happening. But... You have some testimonies of what happened through the way God used you. Just share some of that with us. Like you said just now, not everyone has been called for retail. Mm. And you do meet people that gets tired. You do meet people that gets um, demotivated. Because you've got a personal life as well. And sometimes the pressure just gets too much. Mm. I had a um, department manager a few years ago who just, he was just tired. And he put his resignation letter on my, on my desk, knowing that his wife was pregnant and there's a, there's a baby on the way. Um, if, I, if I put the managerial hat on, I would say thank you, fill in the form and have a nice day and uh, all the best for you. But... You take the resignation, put it in the drawer, and say, let's just chat. Are, are you really... Why? Why do you want to... Why do you feel like this? Why do you want to do this? Do you realize what your future will be like? And that day, I didn't speak. We tore up the resignation letter. Two years later, he became a store manager. Um, he's one of our big store managers currently in the company. Hmm. And his life just turned around on that specific day. Wow, wow. So through that, his, his whole hmm. family was, hmm. was affected positively. And hmm. yes, and it, that is amazing. Incredible. You don't see it immediately hmm. and you don't realize it. But a few years down the line, if you look back hmm. and then you realize, wow. Mm, got it something, hey. Wow. Yeah. You mentioned something as well about the store in the last few weeks. Just tell us about that. Going through this COVID, um, the store was flying and then COVID came and we took a dive. We took a dive. Um, we lost staff because of the business. There's a lot of our customers that was impacted with, with their business it's losing. And, and If you want to fight something that big on your own, you will fight and you will not survive. Mm. 
three weeks ago, I just called one Sunday morning, I just called all the staff and we went into the front line. I said, today you are going to run. Today we are praying and we believe that we, our customers will come back. We will run today. Are you ready? And we prayed and we believed. Since three weeks ago, our number of transactions we, we, we use as a, as a gauge of customers actually grew from a minus to a positive for the last three weeks consecutively. And that, that is a testimony on its own. It's, it's, it's just amazing. It's amazing. So if you think you can take on life on your own, if Jesus is in your pocket, if he's your best friend, mm. You, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, fear anything, anything whatsoever. Yeah. I'm just so blessed by hearing where I would have thought is the most unlikely place that I can shine um, and just see how, um, Andre, you've trusted God and you still do every day and it's such a great encouragement to us. Um, so I just, um, thank you so much for what you're sharing. I, I just want to pray for him. Can we do that? And just bless him for being here. Lord, I want to just come and, and pray for this wonderful man of God that was willing to be here today to come and share his story. And Lord, maybe this is part of his testimony in the influence that he will have. And I want to pray that you will quadruple his influence in this store, in the company, in this community, in this mall, um, in his family. Lord, that his faith in your faithfulness, being with him, guiding him, giving him strength for every day. Lord, we want to pray that the testimonies will be endless upon the amount of people that have been impacted through his care, his management, his leadership, his salt and light. And Lord, we bless him. May he know that he's loved, appreciated, and honored for what he does. And Lord, may there be nothing that influences him in such a way that he will doubt in your word and doubt in your ability through him. We pray for his protection, that you'll guide him. And Lord, that wisdom and knowledge will be known to come out of this man's mouth and his heart as he leads well. So thank you, Lord. We honor you for him and the way that he came and shared a testimony about your greatness. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Thanks, Andre. Thank Appreciate it. I can't help but think that we all thought, okay, okay, that in my space, what did that look like, you know? Where am I at? Where, where can God use me in the same way? Um, maybe you've got those testimonies and that's beautiful. I, I love how... Um, in Timothy, 1 Timothy 4 verse 12, we get a practical way of what we can maybe start doing tomorrow or continue doing. And um, here Paul writes to him, this young church leader, and he says to him, don't let anyone think less of you because you are young. Be an example to all believers in what you say, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity. Interesting concepts. And I was a little bit uh, challenged by just all of them to say, okay, Lord, maybe I have to think again. What is it that I say? What comes out of my mouth in certain situations at work? Whenever I speak, do people have to forgive whatever I'm saying? And I'm saying, don't listen to me now, but, or do I trust God that life will come from my mouth and that the overflow that Andre spoke about will be evident through what I say? How do I live? Is everything that I'm doing aligned with godliness and integrity and holiness? How do I love? Do I have compassion with others? Do I love those that are convenient to love? Or do I love everyone that God places in front of me? Is my faith strong? Do I have vision? Do I trust God on what He's saying? And is my love pure? Or am I allowing sin to come and take away my saltiness? And here Paul writes to Timothy and he says, Hey, the influence that I've given you, share it out. Make it visible. Trust me for it. If it doesn't make sense to you in your environment, don't you worry. I will show you. And I will use you powerfully. I know that in this conversation, I think many of us feel a little overwhelmed. And I don't want to pretend like we're all there where we're going, yeah, hey God, use me. Sometimes it's a bit overwhelming. But I want to I ask that this morning that you will not let the opportunity pass where the influence of the love of God in your life is not real to you. 
Because like Andre said, we can't give from a place where we can't overflow from. If you have to scrape the barrel for something to give every day, and now you have to go and influence other people, it might feel a little overwhelming. But I just realized that we need to be empowered and fill up just with the understanding that when Jesus said, I am enough for you, and I have taken care of everything in your life, if you just trust me and you surrender yourself to me, you see what I will do. And that you should be at a place where you say, Lord, I want you to be the greatest influence in me. The strongest influence into my mind, into my heart, through my spirit, must be the influence of the Holy Spirit that is with you all the time, that reminds you of truth, that brings the scripture to mind. That when you feel down and out and you just feel, I I can't do this no more, when God says, you can, you can, I'm with you. So I, I want you to not try and think of this call to be salt and light without knowing that the source of that God is placed within you. If you just surrender and say, Lord, here I am, will you just be all to me once more? And I want to ask that we take that moment, all of us, doesn't matter how long your journey with God is. Let's close our eyes for a moment and just allow the Holy Spirit to come and just fill your heart in a powerful way that that you can just hear God saying to you that I am with you. Can we do that? Let's just take a moment. Lord, I want to pray through your spirit right now. Will you come and influence us just with your grace?